Researching and writing 18th century Cornish history, I became aware that Cornwall's maritime connections, migrations, and Cornish identity during that time have been greatly overlooked. In contrast, thanks to family historians, heritage projects, and research at the Institute of Cornish Studies and elsewhere, we have mapped and described many aspects of 19th century migration from Cornwall and the extent to which mine workers and their families carried with them and recreated Cornish traditions and communities. Cornish buildings, pasty recipes, Cornish sports, the predominance of Methodism and Cornish carols. The 19th century Cornish diaspora left and recreated industrialized communities forged through early industrialization and migration within Cornwall to mining districts. Unsurprisingly, the 18th century was often referenced as providing milestones en route to what came later. The death of Dolly Pentreath, notionally marking the end or interruption of Canuig as a spoken language, the arrival of John Wesley and early Methodism, and the evolution of mine pumping engines, which led Halliday to sum up Cornwall's 18th century history as essentially the history of its mining industry. What this lacks is an awareness of Cornwall's participation in Britain's maritime activities, the assertion of claims to additional territories and increased migration within the island of Britain. It is possible to identify individuals from Cornwall in records of British factories or trading posts across the globe, as well as chartered companies organizing Britain's trading activities the Royal African Company, the South Sea Company and the East Indies Company, whose archives are increasingly digitized and online. It would be possible to develop group biographies of at least some of the Cornish men and women who left 18th century Cornwall to pursue trades and professions overseas or elsewhere in Britain and the extent to which they carried a Cornish family and community identity with them. And it would be well worth investigating the extent to which 18th century Cornish migrants formed networks and communities, as we know the diaspora from Wales, Scotland and Ireland did. I'm going to focus mainly on migration and travel from and to Cornwall in the 150 years between these two statements. Joseph Glanville was born near Plymouth into a Puritan family. He was a minister who adapted to the restoration. Glanville's essay on the vanity of dogmatizing in 1661, was one of the communication channels through which he shapeshifted his position. Obtaining his first appointment as Vicar of Froome in 1662 and establishing a reputation for philosophical or scientific speculation, which was confirmed by his election to the Royal Society in 1664. Glanville speculated that, it may be some ages hence, a voyage to the southern unknown tracts yea, possibly the moon, will not be more strange than one to America. To them that come after us, it may be as ordinary to buy a pair of wings to fly into remotest regions, as now a pair of boots to ride for a journey. And to confer at the distance of the Indies by sympathetic conveyances, may be as usual in future times, as to us in literary correspondence. Glanville never traveled to America, but growing up near Plymouth, he saw crossing the Atlantic as routine. By 1811 in London, the poet Anna Letitia Barbo was mindful that global trade created two way movements of people, writing in the language of the day, including words we would not choose to use today. The mighty city, which by every road in floods of people poured itself abroad, ungirt by walls, irregularly great, no jealous drawbridge and no closing gate, whose merchants, such the state which commerce brings, sent forth their mandates to dependent kings. Streets where the turbaned Muslim, bearded Jew and woolly Afric met the brown Hindu. And it was equally true that Cornwall's maritime connections diversified the population. As Jewish communities established synagogues and burial grounds in several Cornish towns, Mariners and others of African descent arrived and settled in Cornwall, and individuals from the East Indies were occasionally listed in parish records, including Felicia and Ishmael Rodney, who were christened at Helston in May 1784. Thinking about early migration, 
Fisheries and other maritime trade led some people to travel from Cornwall and some settled overseas. Cornwall's traditional exports of processed fish to Iberia and the Mediterranean, the Newfoundland cod fisheries and the development of plantations in the Americas were all associated with Cornish migrants. Some of the Cornish participants in early North American colonial settlements were briefly summarized in Philip Payton's The Cornish Overseas. Individual decisions to travel abroad or migrate might be made for reasons of work, faith, political causes, or in search of opportunity or as a fugitive, and some were later transported. Compared to 19th century migration, we know less about the maritime and fishing traditions, agricultural practices and Cornish customs carried to new settlements, and the extent to which Cornish was spoken by some of these earlier migrants. Cornish music was one of the formative influences on folk music in Newfoundland, where there were Cornish settlers associated with the cod fisheries. A dish called a venison pasty was served with cold beer at Salem in 1628. And almost a century later, one of the Cornish language letters to William Guavas was to a Cornish family in colonial America. Marblehead, shown on the map here, was a coastal community where fishermen and boat builders were said to have initially continued practices which were characteristic of 17th century Cornwall and Devon. There is a tradition that the mariners and fishermen who settled at Marblehead, which was known as Foy, included Cornish migrants. This probably arose partly from the fact that an early advocate for the development of a substantial fishing community at Marblehead was the Puritan minister at Salem, Hugh Peters, who was from Foy, the son of Martha Trefy, who had married a Dutch merchant. Peter's wife and her adult children from a previous marriage joined him in America, where his brother Thomas Peters spent some years living in Connecticut before returning to be the minister of Myla in Cornwall. Marblehead deeds were initially issued at Salem. In the late 1640s, Marblehead became administratively separate and had a reputation for being less puritanical than Salem. Hugh Peters had returned to Britain, where he was active on the parliamentary side during the Civil War. Seen as one of the instigators of the decision to execute Charles I, Peters was one of those who was then executed following the Restoration. His family forfeited their estates, with the exception of a farm at Marblehead. A family surnamed Trefy became not notable residents of Marblehead in the later 17th and early 18th century. The continuing residence of Cornish identity during the English Civil War was revealed in Mark Stoyle's West Britons. Individuals from Cornwall were, am were among those who migrated to the Americas during the interregnum. After Cromwell's fleet arrived in the West Indies, some former royalists chose to leave Barbados. Francis Willoughby briefly established Willoughby Land in what was later Dutch Suriname. Where Willoughby's agent was a Cornish man named John Trefy who managed Willoughby's plantations. A second Cornishman was also influential in the administration of Willoughby land. Colonel George Martin was a tobacco merchant, the son of, of the Loyalist MP for St. Germans and later of St. Ives. These two Cornish men in South America in the mid 17th century were described a quarter of a century later in a novel, Arunico by Afro Ben, who may have visited Suriname in the early 1660s. Ben identified John Trefy as a Cornish rather than an English man. As described by Ben, Trefy was ambivalent about Britain's reliance on enslaved labour, personified in the novel Tritanicist Arunico, uh, who was an enslaved African. In the novel, Trefy completed the slave trade transaction, which brought Arunico to one of Willoughby's plantations, where Arunico revealed that he was an African prince or king. Trefy then established what Ben saw as a respectful relationship with Arunico, in which his status and education were acknowledged. And yet in the end, Trefy stood by as Arunico was brutally put to death. Replaying in Ben's novel some of the legacies of regicide in the English Civil War, while morally questioning slavery is inhumane. By the 1680s, when Arunico was published, Cornwall's maritime trade was substantial. This is one page of a Falmouth port book 
which includes imports of plantations produce, including tobacco and sugar from Barbados. Brian Rogers, whose brief biography was published in the Old Cornwall Journal by the late James Wetter, was the Falmouth merchant and shipping agent with the lion's share of this transatlantic trade. In conducting commercial transactions at Falmouth, Rogers accepted cultural differences. Working with the female supercargo of a Dutch ship, which called at Falmouth en route to New York, and completing the import administration for a ship from Barbados, carrying individual consignments from over 30 Sephardic Jews who were trading on the island. Falmouth's experience, as well as capacity for overseas shipping, led to packet boats being stationed in Cornwall from 1688. Before the development of the packet service, official mail was sometimes entrusted to the commanders of merchant ships. Humphrey Pellew of Penryn carried some official mail as the commander of a London tobacco ship. Pellew also carried indentured servants to Maryland, where he and his wife acquired a plantation before selling and investing the proceeds in the development of Flushing in Cornwall. Trade and communication networks, often centered on faith communities or political causes, as well as country of origin. Although the packet service provided regular sailings which were valued and relied on by merchants, these other relationships continued to be important. Some individuals in Cornwall lived in France where they were participants in Jacobite plots. Quakers on both sides of the Atlantic were part of a network of traders who trusted each other to carry, ship, um, to carry cargoes, letters and conduct financial transactions and who might prefer to employ apprentices, clerks, agents, doctors, and sea captains from backgrounds similar to their own. On both sides of the Atlantic, that included Cornish Quakers. At Falmouth, several generations of the Fox family were doctors and consolidated their position as merchants, ships, chandlers, and shipping agents in the late 18th century. Following the American War of Independence, William Roach, a Quaker merchant in Nantucket, considered relocating his fleet of whaling ships to Falmouth. When Mary Coppinger traveled from Tulisic House in Cornwall to take some of her children to Catholic schools in Flanders, she was able to draw 20 pounds from the Hennessy's bank in Ostend. Both the Hennessy's and Mary's husband, John, Coppin John Coppinger, were merchants and Catholics whose families had originated in Ireland. Cornish merchants were participants in the transatlantic economy built on slavery and the slave trade, as plantation owners and as importers of plantations produce. Great Cornish landowners profited from investments related to the activities of the Royal African Company, South Sea Company and East Indies Company. Cornish mariners, merchants and attorneys were employed by these companies. Thomas Corker, who was born and is buried at Falmouth, lived in Africa for 15 years where he was a factor for the Royal African Company, which also retained an agent in Falmouth. Peter Hill, who was one of those agents, was involved in the company's efforts to send Cornish miners to Africa to establish gold mines in the early 18th century. Some of the first Cornish miners to travel to work overseas and an, an initiative which was unsuccessful at that time. The location of packet boats at Falmouth meant that there were regular sailings to Lisbon with its onward connections to Portuguese territories in South America and to the West Indies. Shipping routes which employed Cornish mariners and carried trade communications for Cornish merchants and plantation owners as well as passengers. Edward Trelawney was governor of Jamaica and anonymously published a pamphlet on slavery, a dialogue in which one person set out the ethical case against slavery while the other argued it was economically necessary. When Trelawney returned to live in Britain, he retained plantations in the West Indies, which he bequeathed to his wife in 1754, who many years later left them to her sister. John Trefy and Edward Trelawney were perpetrators of enslavement. Nonetheless, when the novelist Robert Paltock created the character of Peter Wilkins, who persuaded the, um, the king in the novel to abolish slavery, he identified him as a Cornish man traveling abroad. Paltock's protagonist was an adventurous, empathic, inventive man. Like Joseph Glanville, Paltock anticipated the development of human flight. During his travels, Wilkins has a relationship with a woman who could fly. In 
And later in the 1790s, when the Methodist mine captain Richard Williams wrote a poem calling for the abolition of slavery, he identified himself first and foremost as a Cornish man of Gwenap rather than as a Methodist or a mine captain. Individuals from Cornwall were also among those who escaped ca captivity abroad. Thomas Pello published an account of his experience as an enslaved European in Morocco after he returned to Penryn. The transported convicts who escaped by boat from Botany Bay to Timor included the Cornishman William Bryant, who planned the escape and made preparations for the voyage. The Cornish woman, Mary Broyd, who was married to Bryant and had two children, traveled with them. And James Martin, who originated from Ireland and left a written account of their voyage, had also been sentenced at the Cornwall Assizes. From John Profy in the 1660s to Richard Williams in the 1790s, referring to Cornish origins was part of how some individuals identified themselves or the way in which they, are, they were defined by others. Natural historians like William Borlase consciously sought to identify and describe distinctive characteristics of the Cornish people. The distinctiveness of Cornish identity was sufficiently widely recognized to be part of how writers constructed fictional characters and defined historical individuals as independent minded and resourceful. Probably the best known 18th century maritime trade from Cornwall is channel crossings by smugglers, a trade built on the long-standing interconnections between Cornwall and Brittany. We know from the research of Tony Paul in the National Maritime Museum Cornwall and others that fishermen completed smuggling runs and there were frequent sailings to Roscoff from Mounts Bay and Coverack. What has been less recognised is that some individuals moved from Cornwall to live in Brittany and merchants from Roscoff Roscoff moved to live in Cornwall. The smuggler Harry Carter briefly lived at Roscoff where he opened a shop and he was visited by some of his brother's children. My research showed that smuggling was led and organised by merchants in Cornwall, France and the Channel Islands. John Coppinger, who was of Irish descent, moved from Roscoff to Cornwall in the early 1770s. Tea and other products imported at Lorient, which is pictured here, and spirits manufactured in France were retailed from warehouses at Roscoff. During the French Revolutionary Wars, some British merchants living at Roscoff brought their families to live in Cornwall, and Cornish mariners and traders who did not leave were among those who became prisoners of war in France. Cornwall's connections with Lisbon were important from the 16th century to the 19th century. Iberia, as well as Italy, were the markets for Newfoundland cod. In the early 18th century, the Asiento contract meant that Britain carried enslaved Africans to Spanish and Portuguese territories and developed British factories in South America. It was partly because of these connections that the packet service provided a regular service between Falmouth and Karuna and later to Lisbon. The Falmouth packet boats carried passengers as well as mail returning with gold bullion. Um, mined by enslaved labour in Portuguese colonies. Cornish merchants settled or established agents at ports including Cadiz, Lisbon, Oporto, Naples and Puerto de la Cruz in Tenerife. Some merchants and mariners moved with or established families in these ports, including Samuel Raglan from Falmouth, who married and had a family at Naples, where his banking clients included William Hamilton, who was a substantial art collector. And the privateer commander Francis Ford of Penzance, who lived at Lisbon, and whose daughter later married a Portuguese merchant from Oporto at Madron. During the Napoleonic Wars, some Cornish naval officers lived at Lisbon and commanded Portuguese ships, including Admiral Samson Michel and his family, who were from Truro. Cornwall's participation in Britain's trading and other connections with South America enabled Richard Trevithick to sail from Penzance to Peru in 1816. The tin industry was one of the reasons there were long-standing maritime connections between Cornwall and London, where many Cornish merchants established agents and offices. When Thomas Pello arrived in London after 23 years in Morocco, he went to the wharf near London Bridge, which was used by Cornish tin ships, and then to the tavern frequented by Cornish mariners, and was able to obtain a passage home to Falmouth. Decades later, when the pardoned and freed convict Mary Broad decided to return home, 
she said her goodbyes to James Boswell in the tavern at Beale's Wharf near London Bridge, where they shared a bowl of punch before she boarded the Anne and Elizabeth, which was departing for Foy. Cornish mariners who settled in London often lived near the docks and walls from which they sailed. Manual workers from Cornwall were among those who migrated to urban centres. Mary Broad's married sister Elizabeth was living in Plymouth in the early 1780s and by the early 1790s another sister Dolly was in service in London where one of her brothers was also living. We know that people from Cornwall socialised together in London and it would be worth exploring how far they established local communities like the Scots in 18th century London who congregated and lived near Church of Scotland churches. Many individuals from Cornwall who were professionals or traders lived or studied in London, including some who qualified in medicine, were lawyers, or completed apprenticeships with London merchants. Gentry and landowning families in Cornwall sometimes travelled to London for the winter season. That included women as well as men. The miniature painting here is, is one of the Miss St Albans who spent some time in London. We know that there were Welsh clubs and societies in London whose members organised charities to assist people of Welsh origin or invested back in Wales. And that included individuals who were active in the Welsh revival and financed collections of Welsh language publications. There had been long-standing informal arrangements for MPs in Cornish seats to meet together to discuss Cornish interests. In 1768, a dining club was established in London called the Cornish Club, which met regularly during the winter season with a maximum of 50 elected members who were all men. Further research might show how influential this club was. Its membership included Davis Giddy or Gilbert, who was associated with Cornish language publications. Malachi Hitchens from Gwenap, who's pictured here holding a globe, worked at the Royal Greenwich Observatory before becoming a minister. After Hitchens was appointed as the Vicar of St. Hilary, he lived in Cornwall where he continued to organize human computers who completed calculations for the nautical almanac. He also tutored Davis Giddy, William Duncan, who later worked at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, and Tamsin Dennis, who was employed as a governess to the family of the second Josiah Wedgwood and later published a novel. Although there is evidence that people from Cornwall socialized together and sometimes helped each other with accommodation or other matters in London, those pursuing professional careers or creative vocations needed to establish a wider range of contacts. Mary Wollstonecraft was painted twice by John Opie and her social circle included writers who had family connections with Cornwall, including the poet Anne Batten Crystal and the novelist Eliza Fenwick, whose parents had made the move to London. Tobias Smollett was a Scot living in London who had learned to speak Gaelic as, as well as English as a child, and whose first publication was Tears of Scotland after the Battle of Culloden. Smollett married into a family of plantation owners in Jamaica, from which he derived some of his income, and developed a career as a professional writer on varied topics, whose last novel, The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker, was the only one to be set partly in Scotland. When Fortescue Hitchens, who was the son of Malachi Hitchens, decided to write a poem mourning the loss of life in the 1811 sinking of the HMS St. George, he probably chose to call it the Tears of Cornubia in emulation of Smollett. Fortescue Hitchens was an attorney who had completed an apprenticeship in Ply Plymouth and worked in London before returning to Cornwall to practice in St. Ives. He published three volumes of poetry and was revealed as the author of verses signed with capital letter X in local newspapers. Hitchens also wrote a history of Cornwall, which was posthumously published by Samuel Drew. Over 700 men lost their lives on the HMS St. George. From naval records, we know that 15% of the crew had been born outside of the British Isles. Hitchens was most acutely aware that several of the officers and other men who died in the wreck were from Cornwall, and he was writing partly to encourage charitable donations to their bereaved families. The HMS St. George sank in a winter storm on a homeward voyage, but the poem also communicated weariness after 18 years of almost continuous war with France. Although the poem's title is focused on Cornwall, Hitchens' verse voiced multiple loyalties 
which he appears to have equally accepted in relation to Britain, England, Albion and the King. The HMS St George was lost in 1811, the year when Anna Letitia Barbo identified London as a multicultural centre of global trade. Fortescue Hitchens was no less aware that global communications and conflicts had impacts and consequences in Cornwall. Cornwall's history of the 18th century was only partly about mining. Cornwall's maritime connections, migrations and Cornish identity merit greater attention 